now we're bringing our, our discussions about African Americans and the particular denominations, the traditions that, that, that caught on the most among African American communities, largely Protestant ones, to, to a close as well in this chapter. Um, so we don't have to do a, a lot of review, but there is some review to do, you know, with the backstory, because there's going to be certain events that are particularly key. Um, what would they be for understanding why African Americans are in what churches they, they're in, for example, or, or why African American Christianity is discussed as something distinct? Is it, is it just that, well, you know, every race needs to have its own particular version of Christianity? Um, and we don't talk about Asian Christianity, do we? Or Chinese Christianity? There are, you know, Chinese Christians. Why, you know, why is it so distinctive? Well, where should we start? Yeah. Well, like when they were freed, they would like go to the north. So. Okay. So we start out with slavery in the south, right? What ends that? Officially, the Emancipation Proclamation. But what really ends it? Yeah. The Civil War. Yeah. The Civil War. South loses, North wins. Um, so the regime of slavery comes to an end. They go through this period that they call Reconstruction, <clears throat> which was a very turbulent time. The economy of the South had been largely devastated. Um, there, there were a lot of forces uh, attempting to sort of reimpose the old order back on the South. At the same time, there were um, Northern abolitionists who wanted to try to you know, create a new order, and uh, African Americans sort of caught in the middle, you know, <coughs> wanting something better for themselves, and quite often you know, being, being subject to a lot of uh, uh, violence and, and abuse. And this goes on, Reconstruction doesn't last very long, but the new sort of system in the South goes on for, for quite a while. Um, you're right, quite a few of them go to the North. So let's actually put like, sort of a split here. Um, in some sense, we can talk about different African American experiences in different parts of the country. Um, what does it mean to go to, to the North? Why are, why are African Americans, are, are they leaving the South just because they, this is, you know, this is nonsense down here. We're not going to put up with this sort of stuff. Let's get let's get out of here. The North had factory jobs, which a lot of Africans attracted to. Right. So there's the possibility of economic prosperity. Um, and when we talk about the North, we're not just talking about the big northern cities. We're also talking about immigration into you know the cities of the Plain states, like like in Kansas. Um, there's the, this entire development for a while, and sometimes it's stymied by, by violence, of uh, you know, a black middle class. That's, that's where some of these, these uh, race riots you know, turned around. Um, they, they were successful in, in the North. There were jobs. Uh, it was possible. Now, what put the kibosh on that? What, what created a lot of problems, whether you're black, white, you know, Asian, anything? Because the prosperity didn't go on forever. It's, it's long past even our grandparents' memories. Um, Great Depression, you know, running through the 1930s. Uh, and then we have the wartime years, and eventually we start to see, you know, all these discussions of integration, civil rights emerging in the 1960s. Um, what's happening in the South during, after the Civil War, <clears throat> but, you know, say before the 1960s? Well, the South is what are, what is, what are the, the things sort of influencing African American prospects? Yeah, segregation. 
Yeah, an incredibly um, pervasive regime of segregation. I mean, you guys have all seen the images of separate bathrooms, separate drinking fountains. Um, the sharecropping, which essentially turned, you know, amounts to a new type of servitude. Um, Sharecropping meant that that you would have to work on somebody else's land, and you wouldn't, you'd never be able to own it because you'd actually have to give a lot of, you know, what you produce on that land to the person who owns the land. You might also be in debt to them for all the equipment that you're using, the seed that you're using, and they would get the bulk of it. So this is a way to keep people in something like, you know, I wouldn't even say indentured servitude because indentured servitude would end after seven or, or fourteen years. Um, this could people could keep people in um, uh, servitude for generations. And then there's this what they call the Jim Crow regime, um, which includes you know segregation and things like that, but also has to do with with keeping African Americans from being able to exercise um, the power of the vote. You know, having poll taxes or, or things like that. Um, two very different experiences. And the North and the South are, are rather different from each other. Was there segregation in, in the North? Um, let's ask about that both after the war and before the war. Yes, there was some segregation. We're going to see that that plays an important role in church formation for some African American denominations. What about after the war? After there's a lot of black immigration to the to the north, segregation exists. It does, you know, in, in large part, uh, particularly in the big cities. Um, I know when I was a kid, and I, I grew up, you know, not in Milwaukee, but on the outskirts, you know, out in the country, out of what we would call Greater Milwaukee. One of the big uh, controversies at the day was, should children from, you know, Waukesha County be bused into Milwaukee County, largely white children from the, you know, more prosperous areas into um, these urban schools, and should black children be bused out uh, correlatively? I'm talking about bus rides of like an extra hour or maybe two each day. And there was intense opposition to it. It was called desegregation um, because there was a lot of segregation. There still is actually quite a bit of segregation as far as race goes in Milwaukee, um, even to this day. It's largely economic, economically driven, but um, it's it's still there. Yeah. Yeah, it was pretty insidious segregation. It was even people who would be considered white in every other context. Oh, But if you yeah. were in a state that was incredibly racist, there was no escaping it. Like, my grandfather, who's lighter than me, but he had an afro. He was a barber in, I believe, North Carolina? Okay. In the 1950s? And they told him to get out of the shop and work at the Negro barber shop because he couldn't fit in. Interesting. Yeah, just, he, he left the Carolinas as fast as he could. You know, when I worked in Indiana State Prison, I was it was really interesting to find out that the Indiana Department of Corrections listed only three races, and it was black, white, and other, because the only races that really you know mattered as far as race was concerned were black and white. Um, it was sort of uh, Indiana's kind of a southern state in many respects culturally. Um, yeah, I mean, I mean, this this does go on in, in the north as well. Now, what, what's the sort of upshot of this? Well, there is this intense, in, you know, imposition of difference, and the question is, what are they going to do with that? And then, how does that affect their religious life? How does that affect their approach to to God in community, in terms of how they're going to live their lives, how they're going to worship? And your book talks about. Um, Several different major, let's call them uh, denominational traditions uh, for African Americans. 
these result in, in many cases in what we call historically black churches, just like we talk about some universities as being historically black colleges or universities. Um, foremost among these are Methodist denominations, like the American Methodist Episcopal Church and American Methodist Episcopal Zion Church. And both of these, which are very similar to each other, are formed precisely, they're formed in the north, and they're formed precisely out of the experience of, of segregation, out of the experience of not being able to sort of benefit from the, the, the investment of labor into things. It talks about Richard Allen. Um, Richard Allen and his black colleagues attempted to participate fully in worship at St. George's Methodist Church in Philadelphia. Now notice the date, November 1787. So we're going back a very, very long ways. Um, they collectively withdraw from the church and they form this network of black churches that parallel the white denominations. Uh, eventually, he founds the Bethel African Methodist Episcopal Church and we, we get you know, one of these denominations out of that. Um, there were uh, other important uh, Methodist denominations as well. The Originally, um, Colored Methodist Episcopal Church, uh, now called the Christian Methodist Episcopal Church, founded in 1870 by Southern blacks who, who wanted to leave the Methodist, Episco the Methodist Episcopal Church south. Why? Because that had split from uh, its, its northern co-religionists over the question of slavery. Um, what, other, what other denominations have really attracted African Americans? Yeah. Baptist? Yeah. Uh, in, in some respects, they've been more successful. If we want to look at the sheer numbers alone, um, Baptists were one of the major religious groups in the South, along with Methodists and along with you know, Presbyterians. There is, by the way, one African American Presbyterian church. Um, but, it, but it's not very large. But Baptists, um, here we're talking about some, some really major denominations. Um, I'm just going to put down NBCs, and by this we're going to understand the various national Baptist conventions, because there were splits within it with different organizations retaining the name and you know, distinguishing themselves from each other in, in fairly minor ways. And then there was the Progressive National Baptist Convention as well. Um, thinking about what you know about Baptists, why would this be particularly attractive after the Civil War for African Americans in the South? What do you need to start a Baptist church? Do you need a bishop to come in? Do you need you know, overseers and a whole institutional structure like you do with, with Methodists? The Baptists are like self-disciplined, so like they can make up what they want. Right? It's a very ground up kind of kind of movement. So it, it's it, you know it's pretty easy to build new churches, to spread. Um, Quite often you didn't have to be, you know, the Methodists were, were a bit more um, demanding in what they expected in, in training of ministers than Baptists were, although there are some really great Baptist seminaries. Um, it's interesting, too, because after the Civil War, your book doesn't talk about this. There's a lot of, let's call it, not quite conflict but um, very hot discussions amongst African Americans in the South about which churches they, they ought to join. And you know, churches like the American Methodist Episcopal Church, American Methodist Episcopal Zion Church were coming in from the North and they had, you know, they had some resources, they had some backing, um, but they also sort of were felt to, to, to not really harmonize as well with African-American Christians in the South who wanted a more emotional, focused, 
uh, type of type of uh, service, who felt that these uh, groups were a bit more doctrinaire, a bit more you know sort of stick in the mud, and the Baptists actually were seen as as being you know more able to meet their needs. They they got it better. Um, what other groups? What other Christian denominations? Catch on. A little bit later. We're talking about a bit of a later time now. Um, yeah. In New York City, there are a lot of uh, African Americans that attend Catholic Church. Yeah, now that's part of the story. Um, and this chapter doesn't dwell that much on that. Interestingly, remember when we talked about Catholic school systems? There have always been some, some African American Catholic converts. Um, and there were some, you know, uh, you know, outreaches and missions and even orders devoted to that. Um, the Catholic school, one of the, the upshots of the Catholic school systems remaining in place, even after um, a lot of the Catholics had moved out, was African American parents using them as a place to send their children so that they would have, you know, a disciplined, orderly, high academic standard environment, safe environment. And that has actually ended up producing a lot of African American converts who then send their kids you know, to Catholic school. Um, so that's kind of an interesting side note. But a much larger um, proportion would include uh, churches like the um, Church of God in, in Christ. Um, a major African American church. What family, what denominational family does that church belong to? Does anybody know? I mean, you, you can go into African American neighborhoods and you're going to see a lot of Church of God in Christ churches. What's, what's different from between them and the Baptists and the, the Methodists? They're the largest of this, this group. Your book uses the term sanctified. When we see that, we ought to think um, holiness or Pentecostal. Um, church of God in Christ is a Pentecostal church. It actually had, a, had an offshoot, um, which, which was a, a holiness, but not Pentecostal church. So, We've talked a little bit about this. This is sort of the denominational landscape. And then there's, you know, things. There are black Lutherans, too, you know, because uh, the Missouri Church, uh, Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod, sorry, um, succeeded in doing quite a bit of outreach to, to African Americans uh, in, in their time. But those tend to be kind of small. These tend to be the really big groupings. Um, what's, what's similar... Then, and what's different from African American churches and, say, white Methodists or white Baptists or, or white Pentecostals? So your book talks about this uh, in these terms. It says, worship in black churches shares many of the theological and liturgical premises, um, but few black services are exactly like their white counterparts. Social class plays some role here. Um, if you're higher social class... There's kind of a hierarchy here. Uh, but again, that's similar also, or at least used to be similar, for uh, whites, particularly in the South. Um, Baptists were at the bottom of the, the pecking order until Pentecostals came around. Uh, and then they were seen as being lower. Methodists, you were you know, probably middle class. You could really tell that you'd made it in the South if you were an Episcopalian or a Presbyterian. Um, in the North, you might be a Lutheran. Uh, what else? It says, much of the distinctiveness of black worship has roots in patterns developed during the era of slavery. They include, they include preaching, often based on narrative held together by formulaic phrases. We've talked about this before, this notion that, um, remember how I likened it to Homeric, uh, like the Odyssey, use of stock phrases, you can sort of link things together into these, these quite complex literary compositions. Um, Narrative and moral exhortation are more common than doctrinal instruction. The congregation interacts enthusiastically with the preacher, at least if the preacher is liked, you know, if the preacher is doing well. 
There's a lot of back and forth, which is sometimes missing in uh, white churches. Open emotional expression is a common feature. And then it also talks about gospel music, and it spends quite a bit of time on that. Um, and it even talks about you know, the, the, the function of the, the record industry, and what it played in there. Um, what else do we need to, to hit upon? Oh, the, the role of the preacher. Why is the preacher so important in African American churches? I mean, sometimes people give a preacher a hard time. Well, a lot of preachers are heading for their community. They help organize uh, the community, help uh, give back to the community. They are a lot more involved than a lot of other preachers. Yeah, you know, there's a similar dynamic to when we talked about the, the Irish priest in an Irish parish. Probably one of the few, uh, you know, particularly literate, well-educated people used as an interface between the community and the outside world. And somebody who would also play an important role in deciding things within the community. Um, I mean, that gives you an idea of why in the civil rights struggle the churches were so centrally important, rather than just, say, political organizations. Um, you know, Martin Luther King was a highly educated guy who, I mean, if you actually read his stuff, he's writing about people like Paul Tillich, and, you know, um, he invokes St. Augustine and, and Thomas Aquinas in his letter uh, from a Birmingham jail, and, you know, sort of gives his new take on, on what natural law means uh, in terms of the human person. Very, you know, eloquent and, and, and literate guy. He was able to be that way in part because he's coming from a tradition of ministry, where... A lot of black leadership is coming from the churches. Um, your book then talks quite a bit about, about um, where the civil rights struggle goes. And we only have a, a bit of time to discuss this. Um, it talks about some of the, the influences on it with the motif of liberation. Um, gives you a bit of the history of that. But one of the things that it really stresses is the, the civil rights struggle starts out as partly a political thing and involved some people who were, were not religious, um, but it, had a lot of, it drew in a lot of religious leadership. It also did not bring in all religious leadership. Who is, does anybody remember who King's letter to a Birmingham jail is actually addressed to? Offhand? It's not like a to the nation as such, or, you know, you jerks in, in Montgomery who are, you know, fire hosing us or stuff like that. Who is he writing to? He's writing to religious leaders who are saying, you're doing the wrong thing. You're breaking the law, and the Bible says don't break the law, even if you don't like what's going on. So he's having to justify himself to a lot of religious leaders who aren't involved in the civil rights struggle, who are sort of sitting on the, the side. At the same time, um, like your book points out, the influence of Christianity on, on the, the, the movement was problematic. King was committed to, he's a, he's a Baptist, but who else does he draw on? He draws on some non-Christian sources. Where does he get his ideas about nonviolence from? Exactly. I mean, you know, there's this Jesus guy, too, who also says a lot of stuff about that. But, but you've got Gandhi, so he's bringing in a Hindu religious figure. He also talks about Henry David Thoreau, who we, we tend to associate with transcendentalism or with uh, you know, liberal uh, Christianity, very liberal Christianity. Uh, and then there's, you know, you can see this if you read King's later writings. King himself starts to realize before he dies that the movement has taken a very different turn with the shift to, to black power, but with people like your book mentioned, Stokely Carmichael. Um, you know, Martin Luther King and Malcolm X would be good antipodes here, although Malcolm X is, a, is of course, a Muslim figure. Um, and King was, was very concerned about the fact that the movement was becoming more and more radical, more and more willing to dispense with nonviolence, and sort of distan distancing itself from its originally largely Christian roots. Um, he writes a, a great book called Where Do We Go From Here? If you, if you only read one book by him, I actually would say that's the, the book to, to read. Um, 
There's also an interesting development that takes place, and this is what we'll close with, with the development of what they call black theology. And um, Albert uh, Kliege, the black messiah, is, is you know, one that gets brought up a lot. When you hear this notion that Jesus was black, that's where, that, you know, that's, that's where the trope is coming from originally. Not quite as influential, other than sort of popular culture. James Cone tries to develop something like liberation theology, but from an African-American perspective. Um, in his Black Theology and Black Power, and then a number of other um, things as well. So where, where it closes, bless you, is by saying that African-American Baptists and Methodist churches and their clergy continue to enjoy prestige. Um, and it sort of leaves open the question of where the churches are going to go after this. They've become heavily connected over time with the Democratic Party. You, you guys remember I mentioned, um, when was it, uh, the, where Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama were the two front runners. That was uh, the uh, 2008 election. The, the, it began on the Democratic side by both of them giving speeches at churches, at historically black churches, in Alabama, right across town from each other. Will that continue? There's some tensions between, in part because these churches are actually, in many respects, more conservative than the party with which they're aligned. So there's some tensions there, and uh, that's where the book leaves off, because that's an open question.